Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Andrew Fiala, and I am the director of the Ethics Center here at Fresno State. I want to introduce Professor Jeff Pfeiffer, who is Associate Professor of Philosophy and Global Studies at Wor uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute out on the East Coast in Boston. His PhD is from the University of South Florida. He also has an MA from the University of New Mexico. He works on social and political philosophy, critical theory, global justice, and critical pedagogy. Pfeiffer is co-editor of two books, one with the title The Politics of Desire, Deleuze, Foucault, and Psychoanalysis, uh, and Phenomenology in the Political, as another one. He's also the author of The New Materialism, Althusser, Badu, and Zizak. And he serves as the co-editor of the Journal for Philosophy in the Contemporary World. Jeff, there's a lot of French names there. And if I screwed those up, you, you can correct me on that. Um, so we're going to uh, invite Professor Pfeiffer to take the the uh, take us away in just a second. But before we started with um, his talk, we wanted to share a short video that was made by my student assistant, Lily Bach, that sh shows um, some Fresno State students thinking about cars. So I'm going to find that and share that with you. What word do you associate with a car? Freedom and transportation. Independence, gas, and freedom. Um, I have uh, emotions, um, I would say dynamic and speed. Travel. Do you think uh, you have to rely on a car here in the U.S.? Yes, definitely, yes, but sadly, I don't have one. Yes. In America, yes, <laughs> of course, I would like to have a car. It's pretty hard. I mean, without a friend, with, uh, they have a car, it's nearly impossible. I do. Why do you think Americans rely so heavily on a car? I think uh, because the public transportation is not that good and uh, everything is quite uh, far away from each other, so you need to cover a large distance and with public transportation, it's almost not possible. Um, just because it seems kind of weird to walk or ride anywhere. And mostly because there's not really any room to like bike or walk. It's kind of dangerous and scary. Um, of course, the transportation, because they need it for daily use. And I have the feeling that it's a status symbol. When you look at the whole of village uh, parking lot, there are very expensive muscle cars. And I think that people have it as a symbol. Do you see any other options than owning a car here in Brazil? Uh, public transportation, but not as a real long-term um, option. So maybe if you use it um, for two weeks or so, maybe. But if you need to buy larger quantities or if you need to go something somewhere which is far away and it's not possible um yeah i've used public transportation here before but i necessarily wouldn't rely on it no no i do like bus train do you uber now do you think they're reliable here in uh yeah i would say probably bus more than anything especially because I, is it free for fresno state streets i think it is so i feel like that's for the position I am, that's probably the most reliable. What do you think would be an inconvenience to having an own car if you had one? Uh, the traffic and also um, safety. So um, you need to pay insurance and also um, if somebody uh, breaks into your car. Paying for it every month, insurance, uh, oil changes, gas, especially with the prices. Um, and, you know, when something goes wrong, you have to pay for it. You know, a new engine's like almost $20,000. And my car is only 36000 So you kind of have to think about those situations and whenever they come up, if you're actually going to be prepared for them. Um, so I think the costs and that's all. Uh, maybe when it breaks down, that's that's probably the biggest inconvenience, I would say. Other than that, gas prices, but you know, that's probably the biggest inconvenience for me at least. So there you have some of our students, Professor Pfeiffer, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. All right, thanks. Um, I want to just say thanks to Andy for the invitation um, and to the Ethics Center for hosting and to Lily for um, 
putting together that video and the interview with the students, a lot of what they say <clears throat> um, will definitely come up kind of throughout in various places throughout the, um, what I have to say, and then we can kind of chat more about it um, as we move forward. Let me um, go ahead and open up um, my PowerPoint here. So before I do that, I guess, um, let me just kind of set the stage for uh, what I'm interested in in this talk. Uh, and rather than kind of read an introduction to a paper, I'm going to read some sections of the paper kind of throughout. Um, but just to give you a kind of a, a, a kind of setup for for this, I've thought for a long time um, about thought and taught about climate politics uh, for a long time. I've been thinking and teaching uh, and writing about our kind of contemporary uh, authoritarian movements, kind of the reemergence of authoritarianism, um, both in this country and and kind of around the world. Um, and then uh, more recently, uh, I've been thinking about transportation uh, and cars and automobility um, and all of those sort of intersect in really interesting ways. And so this talk is um, sort of an attempt to be thinking those three those things together. Uh, and so that's those are the kinds of things that will that will come up, and we'll talk about automobile cultures and um, some of the things that the students talk about in their um, in those interviews will will certainly certainly come into play here. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, first, you'll see my super messy desktop. Um, those of you that uh, do not do a good job of organizing desktops. That's 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 me. Um, so now we're in, and um, so I just kind of gave you the setup, and so I'll start. I'll do a little bit of reading here, and then um, we'll sort of start moving through some slides. Uh, so um, part of what I'm going to do to kind of frame this and to kind of think about automobility and think about climate politics and the intersection between automobility, climate politics, and, and authoritarianism um, is to begin by um, using um, Louis Althusser, who's a French Marxist uh, philosopher, um, to help us begin to think about kind of how our own identities so um, are constructed first out of kind of the social, so they begin in the social before they sort of enter into to us and to, to um, our own sort of understanding of ourselves. Um, and then also I want to use uh, Felix Guattari and, and Giles Deleuze's work on um, desire. And so I'm going to sort of unite um, Althusser and, 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 and Deleuze and Guattari on desire in thinking about um, how our affects, so things like the, the way in which we desire, the things we dire, desire, our emotions, um, are also in many ways constructed out of um, kind of our social milieu. So I'm going to start there, do talk a little bit about that, talk about how it intersects with our, our understanding of climate and climate politics, and then say more about this in, in relation to, to cars and, and automobility. Um, so as I say here, um, you know, I'll turn to French Marxist philosopher Louis Althusser and his work on the social foundations of identity. Um, via discussions of what he calls uh, the ideological state apparatus, alongside G Giles Deleuze and Felix Guattari's conception of the ways in which our desires themselves are structured and oriented by material forces outside of us as a means for investigating um, the, the, the sort of topics that we're interested in tonight. So the specific example that I'm going to explore, and I just sort of you know, began to narrate this for you, um, is in the realm of climate politics. Uh, so Andres Malm and the Zeitgen Collective, so these are a couple of other thinkers, um, have recently very nicely made an Althusserian inflected argument that there exists a climate change denial ideological state apparatus. I'll explain what this is in a minute. Um, that has an outsized influence on the ways people think about climate and has allowed decades of authoritarian denialist policy to advance while only making minimal and marginal change. Um, <clears throat> Uh, moments, or, sorry, my talk today builds on this by thinking again at a more micro level, the way such an ISA functions, making many, including those who generally believe in climate change and want broadly to remedy it, unable to let go of certain material existences, such as the one centered around the personal automobile, which as we know is a major influence on climate <clears throat> and has many other negative public health outcomes. Hence the first part of my title here, I will argue that we come to desire the continued use of the personal automobile as a result of the social nature of both desire itself and the structures that entrench automobility in our existence. 
And we do so even when we recognize the negative impl implications for climate and public health in ways that make us so us, that can make us sympathetic to contemporary authoritarian movements who also desire continued fossil fuel extraction and infrastructure that favor the personal automobile over public health and climate. So drawing on this literature in urban mobility, um, urban and mobility studies and human geography, um, I'll show how the desire for continued automobility is so well integrated into our subjective existence for so many of us that when confronted with policy changes that might reduce the use of such technology, even normally progressive and left-leaning people often turn away from those values and toward the more authoritarian politics that prioritizes individual freedom um, and individual freedom to drive over the communal good of climate change mitigation policy and urban public safety. So linking Althusser's understanding of the social foundations of identity and Deleuze and Guattari's understanding of desire's production can help us make sense of this and by extension, a host of other phenomena that push, uh, push individuals toward many kinds of authoritarian politics. And also this can give us a way to imagine confronting and shifting such authoritarian desire. Um, so I'm going to start by talking a little bit about um, Louis Althusser and this kind of social foundations of identity. So maybe some of you have seen this meme if you're, you know, in philosophy classes and philosophy memes, probably not many of you. Um, this is a nice meme kind of showing that sort of Althusser's understanding of these two um, sort of twin processes of subject formation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this now. For Althusser, like many Marxist thinkers, subjectivity, that is our understanding ourselves in terms of our identity, our choices, our beliefs, and our relations to the world, is always constructed within social and economic relations. Subjective freedom is always constrained by those relations, which for Althusser means that such freedom is constrained by the social, economic, political, and legal regimes that pre-exist us as individuals. Those are those structures are through are the structures through which individuals come to be who and what they are. They define the possibilities and limit our choices as they are the historical circumstances of our existence. For Althusser, the process of constructing and constraining our identities is what also allows for the maintenance and reproduction of a given set of social relations. So through our insertion into and identification with such social relations, we come to serve as supports for them. One way of understanding this claim is through the double structure of what all these are terms, the repressive state apparatus. So you see it here on the top in this meme, right? Um, and um, the ideological state apparatus, which you see on the bottom in this meme. I'll say a little bit about each of these in turn. For Althusser, repressive state apparatuses work to construct and constrain us, as he says, quote, primarily through violence or the threat of violence, end quote. They are, the ap they are apparatuses such as police, prisons, and the military whose primary aim are to support a given set of social and economic structures by making sure that if and when individuals step outside or out of line, outside of or out of line um, of these structures and start to challenge them, they'll either be brought back in line with them through the threat of violence, the actual use of violence, or they're simply removed from the social via the use of the prison. These are not, however, in Althusser's estimation, the primary way a given set of social and economic relations are upheld. The primary way is via what he terms the ideological state apparatus. These are apparatuses that do, that do not work primarily via, via violence, threatened or actual, but rather through a kind of process of socialization of individuals that fits those individuals so that fits us to a given set of social and economic relations, such that we come to recognize ourselves in those relations or as subjects of those relations. Ideological state apparatuses are found in things like social practices and traditions, and they operate through a variety of institutions. Althusser's examples of such ideological state apparatuses, or ISAs, I'll refer to them as ISAs just for simplicity's sake, um, are things like educational institutions, religious institutions, as you see in the meme, familial structures, communications institutions, so things like TV, radio, news, political institutions, parties and party affiliations, and other cultural institutions, so arts, literature, sports, music, cars, <laughs> uh, those kinds of things. Um, it is these institutions and their practices and traditions that first begin to shape and mold our identities and also our understanding of the world in ways that make it possible for that set of social and economic relations to be maintained and reproduced. Um, so when I teach Althusser in the classroom, um, I like to use the classroom itself as an example. So I have a couple of pictures here of, of classrooms, one with students and a professor, and then one with just the empty room, and that will become important in a minute. Um, 
the identity categories that exist in a classroom pre-exist myself and my students, right? Yet when we walk into the classroom, we inhabit those categories in, a ways, in ways that we rarely question. My students file into a classroom and sit in desks or tables. They get out notebooks and computers. They talk to each other sometimes until it's time to start. Sometimes they keep talking, right? When it's a sort of lively and good classroom. Um, I, go stand, I go stand and sit in front of the room and either get ready to write things on the board or get my presentation for the day ready. Um, that is, we all engage in practices that we've been socialized to engage in by the educational apparatus, and we recognize ourselves in the identity categories of students and professors almost seamlessly, especially when we walk into a classroom. So looking at the empty classroom, it sort of calls to us, right, this, this sort of identity. These are who we are in these moments, and we show that not usually by consciously identifying ourselves as such. I don't walk in and say, I, professor. Students don't walk in and say, I, student. Um, Right. But rather, uh, we do that sometimes, right? But rather, we do it in our activity, where we sit, how we behave, and so forth. And in doing so, our activity acts as a material support for not only the identities we have it in these times, but also the educational institution itself. The university is, at least partially, maintained by our recognition of ourselves as educational subjects in this way, which, of course, we've been trained to do over the course of our lives as a part of many different educational and ideological state apparatuses, right? By the time you, most people hit university, they're, they're well-versed in, in these practices, right? Um, this process is also true <clears throat> of much of the ways we live our lives. We engage in and are engaged by many practices and traditions that pre-exist us as individuals, but have the effect of producing us as particular types of beings who recognize ourselves in and identify with a whole host of social and economic relations in our society, such that we see ourselves in them. And in doing so, we come to act as supports for those structures themselves. We could even say on this reading of things that our very identities themselves pre-exist us. Um, and they have their existence first not inside of us as individuals, but rather they exist outside of us in the material world, right, in the social and the economic structures that, it, that, it, that we sort of get inserted into, the sets of practices and traditions that we are subjected to and we are subjects of, and the institutions in our society that come to exist inside of us. Um, and, and then later, these identities come to exist inside of us through our engagement with those things. And when we challenge them or step outside of them, the repressive state apparatus is always there to bring us back in line. It is then, right, as we have seen, this process that functions to reproduce and guarantee the continuation of the ISA itself and the larger social structure. Althusser refused to this process as a process of, quote, recognition, subjection, guarantee. Right. So first we recognize ourselves as subjects of the of the of particular practices, and then once we recognize that, we guarantee the reproduction of that system or that ISA, right, that sort of thing. Um, this all happens simultaneously for Althusser. So he's, when he gives the analytic of it like this, he's just sort of trying to pull it apart to help us make sense of it, right? But it all kind of happens in the moment. I walk into the classroom and I all of those things happen to me momentarily, in a, in a moment, right? Um, our, so... Uh, the ways a given social and economic structures maintain, maintains its dominance is through this process. Our participation in a given set of institutions, practices, and traditions is what offers stability to the social. And it's the combination of the repressive apparatus and the ideological state apparatus that produces the, this guarantee. So this helps um, to return to Malm and Zeitkin and to climate politics, make sense of their claims about the existence of a climate denialist ISA. As the unity of quote, professional denialists, anti-IPCC conferences, organized symposia for policymakers, denialist con congressional testimonies, radio and television debates about the reality of climate change, along with an endless flow of printed material disseminating de denialist beliefs, right? This ISA is what makes up the unity, or is, it is made up of a unity of corporations in the fossil fuel industry, such as, and mom and I can quote, Exxon, one of the major sponsors of, of the Global Climate Coalition, they even call themselves that, or Shell, car manufacturers such as GM, Ford, and Chrysler, along with the chemical, along with chemical giant DuPont, and business umbrellas such as the American Petroleum Institute, the U.S. Chamber of Com Commerce, and the American Highway Users Alliance, only to name only a few. 
end quote. So you can see, I just sort of pulled up some headlines um, that kind of point to this kind of denialist ISA, right? And this has been going on for a long time. Uh, this ISA and its institutions and practices have not only influenced US climate policy and politics, but have produced denialist subjects and tendencies throughout the body politics since the 1980s. So it's been happening for a long time. Um, we can add to this, right? There's recent work by Kara Daggett, um, who has been interrogating the relationship between fossil fuel extraction and usage and authoritarian sentiments. As she argues, there are direct links between fossil fuels and white patriarchal rule, such that she determines these relations helpfully, quote, petro masculinities. We must, according to Daggett, recognize the ways that continued fossil fuel usage and advocacy should be seen as, quote, the violent compensation for anxieties provoked by both gender and climate trouble, end quote. And that um, the willful continuation of fossil fuel regimes, regimes are, and here Daggett refers to philosopher Kate Mann's work on misogyny, a misogynistic practice that acts to, quote, punish deviance and reinforce patriarchal rule. We can think here of recent reports detailing the misogynistic violence that comes with the ballooning populations in oil boom towns. For example, the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics in 2019 reported that workmen's camps set up during the oil burn, burn booms in the Bakken region of South Dakota um, was um, brought along with it a major increase of racial and sexual violence. So the report details this, that from 2006 to 2012, and here's a quote from the report, violent victimization by strangers increased by 53% in the Bakken region. The violent victimization of Blacks and Native Americans was 2.5 times higher than corresponding rates for whites. And while men experienced higher rates of violent crime as well, women experienced a 54% increase in rates of unlawful sexual conduct or contact, which was due to a rise in reports of statutory rape and other forms of sexual violence, end quote. For Daggett, the increased threat of climate apocalypse and the near too late growing international consensus around the need to address anthropogenic climate change has led to an increased sympathy for investment in and investment in authoritarian politics by white patriarchy as a means for maintaining their, dom their dominance in a warming world. This helps pull together some of the other trends we see in authoritarian politics um, in that racism, sexism, and xenophobia are amplified in the anxieties about the declining power of petromasculinity and white patriarchy. Here, Daggett argue, argues that we need to understand that coal and oil do more than ensure profit and fuel consumption heavy lifestyles. And this is a quote from Daggett. Um, if people cling so tenaciously to fossil fuels, even to the point of embarking on authoritarianism, it's because fossil fuels also secure a cultural meaning and, a, and political subjectivities. Since the new imperialism of the 19th century, fossil fuels have become the metaphorical, material, and socio-technical basis for Western petrocultures that has extended across the planet. In other words, fossil fuels matter to new authoritarian movements in the West because of profits and consumer lifestyles, but also because privileged subjectivities are oil soaked and coal dusted. It is, Daggett continues, no coincidence that white conservative American men, regardless of class, are the most vociferous climate deniers, as well as the leading fossil fuel um, proponents in the West. Indeed, such analyses, um, as Daggett's here, are prescient. We only have to look at a, re the re a recent warm up speech by Georgia Se State Senator Marjorie Taylor Greene at a Trump rally, wherein she cr decries even the most minimal ways of beginning to confront the climate crisis, the growing market for electric vehicles of all types, and at the same time links this to the with anti LGBTQ sentiments. Greene here claims, and this is a quote from Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, we're going to drill oil right here in the U.S. And you know what? Pete Buttigieg can take his electric vehicles and his bicycles and he and his husband can stay out of our girls' bathrooms, end quote. Um, we can also look to noted misogyny and Andrew Tate's uh, Twitter attacks on Greta Thunberg. So I just have you know this. Some of you may remember this from the end of last year in December. Um, Tate sort of calls out Greta Thunberg on Twitter talking about his 33 cars um, and sort of doing this in a very kind of sexualized way. Please provide your email address so I can send a complete list of my car collection and the respective enormous emissions, right? Um, with a picture of him filling up the, the, the car. And of course, as you know, right, um, Thunberg's reply, those of you that followed this actually got him arrested because they were able to find out where he was uh, for 
arrested for sex trafficking, among other things, right? Um, so you can think about that in the context of Daggett's climates about or, or comments about petromasculinity. There's also this um, other headline from uh, last year, and we can talk more about this idea of rolling coal um, if you all are interested in the Q&A, but a driver was... Um, pulled up alongside a bunch of cyclists who were training for um maybe a triathlon um hit the gas on a, on a truck that rolls coal which spewed black smoke into their faces and then ran them over right so again you can kind of think about this kind of violent these violent acts in this way um so i'll return to this below but i want to say a little bit more about how we might imagine the the power of the ISA working on us at a deeper level, um, worming its way not only into our identities and beliefs and material practices, but into our emotional and effective lives as well. For that, I want to turn to Deleuze and Guattari. So I'll start this section, it's fairly short, with these two quotes. Um, so the first quote is, there are no internal drives in desire, only assemblages. Desire is always assembled. It is what the assemblage determines it to be. Uh, and then the second quote, desire works in the infrastructure, invests in it, belongs to it. Desire thereby organizes power. It organizes the system of repression. So I'll explain what these mean now. For Deleuze and Guattari, desire itself is political. As with Althusser's view of subjectivity, um, for Deleuze and Guattari, our individual desires and their structures are first found outside of us in the larger social world. They are, and then they are reproduced and channeled in us by the larger social whole that we're born into, such that the structure of desire and most of our emotional life, um, really, um, in individuals comes to mirror that of of. Those that, those that exist in society writ large. Um, following Deleuze and Guattari, the social world makes possible a certain sense of desires and affects and forecloses on others in ways that are also sort of pre-individual um, um, and, and the material from which we draw our, indi our individual emotional life. Um, as Jason Reed has shown, um, for, shown us for Deleuze and Guattari, individuation is, quote, a process, not a default state of being. This process moves from a milieu that is um, considered pre-individual, made up of tensions and relations to a process of individuation that increasingly encompasses different levels and aspects, biological, psychic, and social, um, end quote. This is what, in a condensed form, is expressed between the two quotations that make up the epigraph for the section, so the two quotations on, on your screen. Um, Desire is assembled in particular ways as a part of and by a larger social assemblage or a social infrastructure that exists first outside the individual and then is produced inside us via a process of individuation. And this assembly, also like the work of the ISA in Althusser, serves to maintain and reproduce the larger social infrastructure, and thus it organizes power in a particular way. This is accomplished, according to Deleuze and Guattari, through a process of what they refer to as the coding of flows of desire. Following Daniel Smith, um, who's, a, who's a Deleuze scholar, um, we should see the concept of flow as the foundation of Deleuze and Guattari's political philosophy in a way that also helps us understand claims about the production of desire in the social. To understand this, we can start by thinking the ways that bodies in a broad sense, right, so not just human bodies, but bodies, things, right, um, are, con are in, con in a constant movement of connection and disconnection to one another. So let me give you maybe a couple of quick examples. When I move through space, I come into contact with other things, the road, the grass, right? Sometimes I may bump into a table when I'm walking or fall on my bicycle. When that happens, my body moves in ways it doesn't normally, producing breaks or strains or pain, right? Um, it is this movement that is the flow, even in its unevenness, so when I can seamlessly move or when I'm stopped by things. Um, and such flows are controlled and constrained in a variety of ways, right? I can move my body in certain ways, but not other, other ways. I've always wanted to be able to spin my head all the way around. I can't do that, right? <laughs> um, um, my body can flow through certain spaces, but not others, right? Sometimes these constraints are, um, I like the, the lapping laughing face that just floated by. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, the, uh, sometimes these constraints are physical, that I can't walk through tables, right? My legs don't normally bend in certain, certain ways. My head doesn't spin all the way around. But sometimes those are juridical, governed by political laws, right? Or other kinds of norms. We can also think of the flow of capital, right? Money towards some and away from others, or social privilege and access and so forth. 
studying flows and their constraints in this way can get us quite far in social and political philosophy. The constraints and la or lack of constraints are the ways flows get coded by natural forces, by political forces, by laws, by forces of privilege and access or lack thereof. Societies code all kinds of flow flows and in this way produce and reproduce given social structures. These coded flows can be, for instance, as simple as examples given as the examples given above, but they can also be traditions and rules given societies have for things like greeting people, right? Handshakes, kissing on both cheeks, etc. And they can be as complex as norms that exist in a given society that define the distribution of gendered subjects and practices surrounding that distribution in a given place in a given time. The ways that flows are coded then also inform subjects in the present, right, about what it means to be a member of that society with reference to history and tradition. There are the social memory that repeats in the present what it is to be the kind of a kind the kind of being that lives in this kind of place in this time. It is then these coded flows, much like the Althusserian ICAs as that we discussed above, that set the terms of the social within which individuals become subjects. My coming to understand myself in the myriad of ways that I do, for instance, as gendered in a particular way, uh, raced, classed, having a particular religion or not, as having the ability to enter into certain professions or not, as wanting certain things, fearing others, in short, my own social positioning and subjective awareness, along with its attendant abilities and limitations, both social and individual, is the result of my entering into a social world with a certain set of flows coded in certain ways so as to produce, so as to position me in particular ways in relation to, to a given set of social conditions, practices, and traditions, and to make this positioning legible to me and to others in ways that help me understand myself and my social world and help other, others understand me. To return then to the discussion of desire, it too is coded and recoded in various ways at various times as a part of this process, such that it comes to mirror the larger social practices and traditions, such that it reproduces those in the individual who as a result comes to desire in the ways that are legible in a given society. So this is Deleuze and Guattari's addition to the analysis here. They help us see that, as they argue, the libidinal economy is the same as the political economy. Okay. So here's the full sort of theoretical edifice that I'm trying that I that we're building through these comments. Um, if there is no psychic reality without social production, if the social production is material and external to the individual in ways described above, then our psychic reality is nothing more the, than the internalization of the pre-existing social. We're truly social products, even in our in our psychic and affective life, and and. And this most intimate part of ourselves serves the reproduction of a given social structure. So with this in mind, let's think again about cars. Um, so I'm gonna start, so this is a, this is a section on, on mobility. I'm gonna start with some data points. Okay. Um, so, and then I'm gonna tell you an anecdote and then we'll kind of talk more about this. So first the data points, number one, the total percentage of carbon emissions for the transportation sector in the US according to EPA is 29%. That makes automobile transportation the largest single contributor of greenhouse gas emissions in this country. Globally, it's about 21%. So I've got some slides to show you here. So this is the EPA's slide on um, greenhouse gas emissions from 2021 in this country. You'll see the transportation makes up the largest piece of the pie at 28.5%. 20, Here's a breakdown of those emissions in the transportation sector. So you can see um, that passenger cars and light duty trucks make up about 50% of that. Light duty trucks here um, really mean like your pickup trucks, right? So uh, Dodge Rams, um, the best selling vehicle in this country, which is the Ford F-150 fits into that category. All right, so you can kind of see the contribution of, of um, individual per, uh, passenger cars here. Here's the worldwide map on, so transportation drops to about 20%, still pretty significant. If you look at the breakdown of the transportation sector worldwide, you'll see that car, cars, again, cars and vans again, right, make up about 48%. Um, and then, so you can kind of see we're still sitting at about half of that, right, for the individual car. Um, so second point. While it's true that electric vehicles have no tailpipe emissions, the production of lithium batteries is carbon intensive. 
from the mining of minerals, of the, of the minerals that are required, lithium, cobalt, and nickel, to the heating of the minerals to create the chemical processes that make ba the battery viable and so on. So much, so it's so carbon intensive that one recent study found the production of an electric vehicle is actually 80% more carbon intensive than the production of a comparable gas powered vehicle. Now over the life of an electric vehicle, right? It recoups some of those emissions. But I think that we have this view that electric cars are just are the climate solution to the transportation problem when it's it's more complicated than that, right? Um, not to mention that many of the mineral, minerals themselves um, that are used are conflict minerals and found in areas that have required moving people off lands and contribute, and the mining of those contributes to environmental de degradation and so also contributes to continued extractivist and colonial and neocolonial processes. Here are just a few headlines sort of pointing to that, um, both kind of globally and uh, in this country, just so you can kind of see. Um, according to, to recent um, National Transportation Safety Board reports, this last year, so 2022, was the deadliest year in 10 years for people navigating the streets in this country who are not in cars. We can call them vulnerable road users. So 7,500 pedestrians roughly were killed last year, nearly doubled the number um, of five years ago. Right? This data And this data is still missing in some state reports from last year, so it's likely higher. Um, reasons for this are poor non-car infrastructure. So some of the stuff that you know the students were talking about, there's no no place to walk, it's dangerous, right? Um, there are no bike lanes, right? The ever-increasing size of cars, trucks, and SUVs. I think um the statistic is that cars in the last five years have increased in size some some somewhere around 20 to 25 percent. I'll show you some pictures about that in, or some pictures of that in a minute. Another recent study um showed a 55% increase in cyclists killed by motor vehicles since 2010. And if we add to this overall traffic fatalities in the US and worldwide, um, in the US, uh, we hit about 43,000 deaths last year, which is a, about an 8,000 death drop from a few years ago. People were celebrating this, but it's still 43,000 people killed by, by vehicles. And worldwide, the World Health Organization um, estimates about 1.3 million deaths are caused by cars um, every year. Um, there are 290 million automobiles on the road in this country as of 2022. That's a rough estimate. There are different estimates out there. Um, and the U.S. population total is around 335 million, so almost one car per person, including children. So if you think about how many vehicles there are. Um, we should also keep in mind the ways that automobiles have been weaponized against racial justice protesters from the murder of Heather Heyer in, Char in Charlottesville in 2017, the memes promoting automobile-driven violence against protesters, see, for instance, the All Lives Splatter meme, um, as an example, to the many incidents of vehicles hitting protesters and other at other protests in recent years, to a number of bills that have been introduced into, into state legislatures by right-wing politicians and signed into law in a few states, allowing the use of an automobile as a self-defense weapon, much like the stand your ground laws. If the driver, quote, feels threatened, these laws allow for self-defensive defensive violence of running into and over people. So it's just going to show you some of this. You can see the all Lives Splatter meme, if you had not had not seen that before, it was pretty prevalent um, during George Floyd and Mike Brown um, protests. So these two separate, um, you know, three or four years apart sets of, of rebellions and protests. Um, you can see the size of vehicles in these pictures, right? The blind zone test, um, Chevy Tahoe, it takes all the way to that last kid <laughs> to be able to see anybody. Um, you can see this big, big truck here. That sort of stuff. So I just wanted to show you some some imagery around this. So uh, authoritarian desires, indeed. So those are my data points. Um, so now the anecdote. I was on a recent visit to a science museum with my children in a city that's near mine. Like many of these museums, this one had a lot of interactive exhibits, and we were in a section that was dedicated to urban planning. It has an interactive exhibits where you try to build a city that represents or that, that mitigates urban heat island effect using blocks as buildings, fake trees, black pieces of felt that represent parking lots and blacktop. 
blue pieces that represent rivers and bodies of water, white pieces that represent potential white roofing materials, which can reflect sunlight and cool buildings and their surroundings and so forth. Another one taught about things like food deserts by having the user think about where to place grocery stores or farmers markets, urban growing zones and so forth. This is all well and good, but then there was another exhibit where you're a traffic engineer. Here, you're in charge of stoplights and roads and trying to manage the traffic as it builds through a simu simulated rush hour period. Your goal as a traffic engineer um, is to time the lights and make sure the roads are wide enough such that drivers do not get angry during their commute. As you work on this, cars, cars pile up and the lights that signify the cars turn from green, which is, signifies happy, uh, to yellow, to red, obviously signifying anger. There are no pedestrians or cyclists or other non-car users represented at all in the simulation. So let me repeat that. The goal is to set up roads and intersections and, and, and intersection stoplights so as to manage the anger and presumably other emotions of the drivers. This interactive exhibit is a microcosm of the kinds of problems that I think are interesting here. Um, notice the other exhibits are trying to make things more just. Everyone needs access to good and healthy food or reimagine urban space in ways that make it more ecologically friendly and environmental, environmentally healthy for the city's inhabitants, working to solve the urban heat island problem, for instance. This exhibit, however, is about managing driver anger, about making the roads in ways that about remaking the roads in ways that allow drivers to pass through places unimpeded uh, by perceived annoyances like waiting for traffic lights, getting stuck in traffic, and really other people in general, both inside their their own cars and outside of cars, possibly also trying to move through the city to get to where they are going by other means of transit, by walking, cycling, and so forth. So this is a form of what Jason Henderson has termed secessionist automobility. Um, defined as the prioritization of the individual and a withdrawal from public space, community, and interactions with others, along with a concomitant desire for a smooth, individualized transit through public spaces that are often seen as dirty, dangerous, or just plain undesirable. Secessionist automobility is connected by Henderson to what David Harvey has termed um, a larger culture of possessive individualism where private consumption of the home and by the family take precedence over, pub over the public and communal, and private yards and spaces are preferred over public malls, parks, and civic spaces, um, and the private automobile is preferred over public transport. Further, as autocentric cultures and infrastructures grow up through the late 19th and early 20th centuries, other modes of transport are deprioritized. Um, sometimes um, for a variety of reasons in a variety of ways, some are intentional, caused by the car lobby, others are a result of sustained growth in automobile culture and consumption. This recreates cities and suburbs as car-centric spaces, allowing for further individualization as people travel by automobile between home and job into and out of urban centers that are increasingly spaces that deal with the polluting effects of automobile travel, are crisscrossed with freeways and roads, um, and space taken up by car storage or what we like to call parking, right? Scheller and Uri have pointed out um, here, the temporal aspects of automobile cultures are not to be missed as people move more and more um, via automobiles. They move further and further from workspaces and urban centers as car centric infrastructures and living become the norm. The car quote remains the only viable means of highly flexible, flexibleized mobility. Other forms of mobility in the city are by comparison with the car, relatively inflexible and inconvenient. Judged that is by the criteria of automobility itself. It generates and generalizes in particular, the car enables a seamless journey from home away from home to away to home. And this is just what the contemporary traveler comes to expect. The seamlessness of the car journey makes other modes of travel travel inflexible and fragmented. So the key thing to understand here is that cultures of automobility are not simply the result of individual consumer choice. In fact, in many ways, we're not in control of this culture. They are ISAs and with sets of practices and traditions that we are inserted into. They generate their own conditions of existence and, re and reproduction and do so largely with Without our awareness or consent, we are, as Uri and others have pointed out, locked in to what is referred to here as the system of automobility, desiring our cars and all that comes, they have come to signal from conceptions of freedom. So the students talked about this in the video, right? To conceptions of adulthood, 
Um, and our smooth, seamless, individualized transport is what we want, it's what we desire. So here's Uri, so there's one more thing and then I'll stop. Here is Uri's describing the system it's, it's, and, and it's self-generating conditions of reproduction. Automobility can be conceptualized as a self-organizing, autopoetic, non-linear system that spreads, that spreads worldwide and includes cars, car drivers, roads, petroleum supplies, and many novel objects, technologies, and signs. The system generates the preconditions for its own expansion, end quote. There's a lot that can be said here in relation to these comments, but I just want to highlight quickly two of them. First, that we come to judge all their forms of transport from the perspective of the personal automobile finding anything but that inconvenient and inflexible. And second, that automobility as a system is self-reproducing. Um, I'll stop here because I wanna leave time for questions or comments. I had a little bit more, a couple more examples, but I think you can kind of see where automobility becomes the ISA that sort of we recognize ourselves in and then it becomes, we become the supports of that. Um, and we find ourselves supporting it in ways. So when cities try to make policy changes, um, people get mad. <laughs> and I can, I can, could, I was going to talk a little bit about this. Even people with climate friendly values, right, start to sort of disengage from those values and really begin to prioritize the individual idea of the freedom to drive and the freedom to own the car over um, climate and safety concerns for the community. So I'll stop there. Thanks. I can stop sharing. Yeah. Jeff, thank you. And then to our audience, make sure if you have questions or comments, um, post those to the chat or use the Q&A. Um, and Jeff, I'll, I'll just start off. Uh, can you can you just explain a little bit more detail about, I mean, back to that student who said cars provide us with freedom. Yeah. I think, you, and you mentioned that towards the end. Is is he wrong to say that, or like how you know on your analysis, how does that, how do you explain that kind of claim? I mean, I think so. Yeah, it's, it's a it's such an interesting claim, and it's and it's so prevalent. I mean, I think when I was growing up and I first got my driver's license, it was freedom, right? It was you get to I could be a young person, leave my house, go somewhere where my family couldn't find me, right? Um, but if you think about the kind of freedom it is. Um, it, there's a real question about what kind of, whether it's freedom or not, right? I mean, the, the students also talked about the cost of owning a car, right? So I think on average, it's somewhere between $10,000 and $12,000 a year in maintenance for a car. So you have to have an income to be able to do that. Um, we talk about the freedom of, of driving, um, but, you know, I live on the East Coast in Boston and you all in California have similar problems you're not free in a car in Russia, <laughs> right? You're stuck. Um, I will, I cycle, I've been cycling for a number of years to, to work and back and I constantly fly by people stuck in traffic and they're just so angry. Right? <laughs> um, and so, I mean, you can, it's a, it's a weird kind of freedom, sort of like, I mean, I, sometimes I'll think about it as a, somebody who thinks a lot about Marx, right? You know, Marx makes this argument that in, under capitalism, we're freed from, um, being determined in our social position by by blood, right? So in, under feudalism and, and other forms of, of government, it was like, if you were born a peasant, you were just going to be a peasant, right? And capitalism sort of opens this up and you, know, you can raise, you can raise your, your um, you're free to sell wares on the market and then it, it can raise your social status and your class and, you know, those kinds of things. Um, but the weird kind of freedom is that you, you become a slave to selling your labor on the market, but right? you have to do that to live. It's the same kind of thing, right? So well, you're, we're free to drive, but we're enslaved by driving also in all of these other ways, right? So does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's helpful. And just, again, to the audience, uh, feel free to use the chat or the Q&A to send some questions to Professor Pfeiffer. Um, take take that now over to, all, I mean, I, the fatalities of pedestrians and, yeah. um, I mean, that's like 50,000 people a year. Yeah, who are died. Who it, died it, a couple of years ago, it was like it was over that. It was like fifty five thousand, and so people are celebrating that we've dropped in ten ten thousand, and we just accept this as a kind of normal way of of living, right? That's what I was. I mean, why why do we tolerate that? On your, you know, on your, it seems crazy. Like that's that's a significant loss to lots and lots of people, but we just. Yeah. We let it go or what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we just don't think about it in those terms often, right? Um, unless we are in the fields of public health or 
you know, those kinds of things. We just assume, well, yeah, people die in car accidents, right? That's what happens. But it's inter it's interesting when, when we think about it from this perspective, because it's sort of like, well, yeah, but they don't have to. Right? <laughs> we don't we don't have to have society, a society that that prioritizes automobility in the way that we do, um, that allows for those deaths, right? So yeah. Is is that part of the the coded flow that you were talking about? That it's sort of like I mean, if you drive a car, there's always a risk you're going to get in an accident, just like you were saying about bumping your leg on a table or something. I mean, and right. we just sort of, we just go with the flow of like, at, at any given day, we we could die or our loved ones could die. Is that is that is that how that word, that phrase coded flow is working in your? Uh, yeah, that's a nice way to put it, actually. I hadn't thought about it in, in that term. But yeah, I mean, I think that's right. Like, we do, it's, it's almost as if it's not something we think about very often. Um, and when we do think about it, we think about it. In a, in a kind of way that paralyzes us. They're like, well, that's just that's just what it is. And it's just the way our society functions. Um, so yeah, that's a really, yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, so, okay, then, I mean, since we don't have any Q&A yet generating, <laughs> but, um, you know, this, the, the theorists you're talking about are Marxists, and you mentioned that there's a kind of Marxist view of this. Yeah. So, what, so what's the next step? Is there a revolution, like, Drivers of the world unite, kind of, you know, Marxist thing here. We're going to have a revolution. What, what's, what do I you mean? Think? I think, yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think one way to think about this is that if it's the case, so if the analysis that I just laid out is correct or plausible, that, you know, our sort of identities and our practices and traditions are what sort of construct us um, in particular ways, and we just sort of do those things, right? Then, and I kept trying, I tried to emphasize this a couple of different times that it's not so much our fault as individuals because we're locked into this, right? I, I own a car, right? You own a car, we and our sus our 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 you know um structure structures that we that we live under, they make us have to drive in various places, especially if you live in suburb suburbs with not, with not good public transportation, right? And that sort of stuff. So it seems like, right, the answer is that those practices and traditions have to change. Right. Um, and then it, and then we become reconstructed. So part of the talk that I didn't get to is kind of thinking about I live in Boston. Boston has been doing a lot of work um, around kind of implementing Green New Deal policies. One of them is thinking about transportation in the city. They've been building bike lanes, getting rid of parking, really putting roads on what they've been calling road diets. Right. Trying to not expand driving, but try, trying to shrink it. Everybody's mad about it. Right. Um, but what traffic engineers and people that do this work kind of talk about is that well, there's an uproar, right? There's even a term in the academic literature, it's called a bike lash, right? So that when you when you start putting bike, bike lanes in, you have a bike lash. Um, and what you need to do is you change the practices, you change the infrastructure, and people will ultimately adapt, right? Um, but you need some kind of authority to be able to do that. Um, so that's one way to think about it. Right? You, just, you just go ahead and do it. Um, and you do it for climate reasons and you do it for health and safety reasons, right? You put, you put in traffic calming, like speed bumps and that sort of stuff. People are mad about it and then they adapt to it. They get used to it. And ultimately, right. The hope is that they find benefit in it, right. Something like that. So that's one so, way to think. About it. So a question along these lines of like, what's the future and what's the change from, uh, in the Q and a here, um, from an anonymous attendee, um, which, who says, do you anticipate that as the climate crisis is felt by more people, that the movement towards widespread change, both individual and social, will be more likely? Or will it be too late? So, I mean, like in the background, it's hotter than it used to be. And we're sort of right. noticing the storms are bigger. At some point, are we going to take charge of our fate here? Or, or what? I mean, what do you, the climate crisis, what do you think? I mean, I wish I had an answer to that question. I sure hope we do. Um, and I think that there are lots of things being done in lots of places, both to ad adapt, right? So adaptation techniques um, and mitigation, um, but I don't know. I don't like, I don't know where where the tipping point is, right? Um, I do like that, you know, I mentioned in Boston, um, we're kind of leading the charge at, of major cities in this country, really thinking about what is a climate ready urban place look like? And it looks like, Things like transforming our transportation system and doing what we can to, to sort of move people away from the personal car. It looks like transforming our public infrastructure, moving away from fossil fuel. So it's, it, you know, a number of things happening. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't I don't know 
what it takes for everybody. <laughs> I mean, I think it takes advocacy, right? Like we all need to be in the streets or calling our representatives and really working hard to push them because the people in control, I'm not sure are going to do it themselves. Right? What about the cost of gas? I mean, that, that one of the students said that earlier, you know, gas is, is just inflation yeah. has really hit gas prices. Right. That's got to be part of this equation. At some point, it's just cheaper to, to not have a car, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, I think you you can push people and show them those, those kinds of calculations, ten to $12,000 a year in car maintenance, um, plus however much money you spend on gas, right? Really looking at your budget. Is it better for you to not have a car? But then you have to have some kind of infrastructure that that makes it makes not driving better than driving. Um, there are also, you know, lots of interesting carbon tax schemes out there thinking about how we tax carbon intensive industries and maybe returning some of those so that tax to people. So you could create a constituency um, in the form of things like, um, you know, UBI payments and that kind of stuff. So I think there, there's a lot of thought process around that. Um, yeah, that's a good question. You know, one of your students uh, from uh, your university asks, is this Finn Donnelly in the chat? Yeah. And the question is, um, if we replace cars and car-based infrastructure, we'll still need to create a new transportation network. Yep. So how would that new transportation sh network be cost-effective? And I mean, I would also uh, ask you, like, won't there be new um, ISAs and repressive institutions? So what about the cost of the new network? And then what will we be left with? Just new constraints or... <laughs> yeah, I mean, so those are, there are two two different yet connected questions, right? Uh, the, I mean, I think the cost of the new networks, I guess the question is, you know, the, the kind of question here is, well, yeah, it will cost to transform our transportation system and our roads, um, but are those costs worth the lives of people, both in the reduction of traffic accidents and the climate impacts, right? The coming climate impacts that some are already baked in, but some that we can avoid if we start really thinking about this now. Um, and maybe, you know, really thinking about economic growth um, and having to gain value in in our in our in the way we spend money all the time is not the best way to be thinking about things right now, right? Maybe we need to spend money and not expect returns, right, for a little while. Um, that sort of thing. And the question about won't there just be new ISAs? I mean, this is so this gets more into kind of the alt the kind of inside baseball of Althusserian Marxism. Um, um, but I'll try to say this without going too inside inside baseball, that Althusser thinks, of course there will be, right? That that the only way that we come to our identities is through institutions, practices, um, and traditions. And those are ideological, right? And they do construct us. And so he, at one point, you know, he even says under socialism, there will still be ISAs. There will have to be because we will have to sort of, we have to get our identity and sort of maintain the social structure through that. So yeah, yeah. Um, um, Jeff, I'm looking at our time. Let's do one more question and then we'll okay. conclude. And, okay. I, you know, there's a couple in the Q&A, but one that I think is kind of interesting maybe you might comment about is just a simple question. What about Amsterdam? So, yeah. and I think maybe the gist of that question is, are there alternatives that are not car cultures and what do those look like? And, you know, can you give some recommendations for students and viewers where they could look to learn about that? Yeah, I think Amsterdam and Copenhagen are great examples. Both cities ha that have really thought hard about and fought hard to change um, to change transportation infrastructure. And like if you there, you know, they're great, there's great work sort of showing what Amsterdam looked like before the infrastructure change and after. And and in the moments of the change, there's this great image of you know somebody the a, a road has been closed so that it's gonna be it's gonna become for bikes only. And there's somebody in a, in a vehicle is like out of the out of the car grabbing a, a roadblock, like a, a, a thing that's blocking the road and trying to throw it out of the way. So people are it's again a nice example of like it's a tough thing to change, right? Um, but it's about making the commitment to do it. So yeah, I think you know those kinds of places are really good places to think about what different infrastructure might look like. So as we conclude, any any place students can go to get some more research if they're interested in this topic or, you know, what would you recommend? 
Yeah, I mean, there's a ton of stuff out there. Um, a lot of the stuff that I was drawing on comes from mobility studies. So like mobility justice, um, people like Mimi Scheller, um, who I cite at one point. Um, and there's a journal, if you're looking for academic work, right, there's a journal um, called called Mobilities that does a lot of this stuff and it's been around for a while. If you're looking at more popular stuff, there's a great podcast called The War on Cars um, that is run by folks who also run the Streets Blog USA um, uh, website, which does a lot of thinking about transportation, primarily based on the East Coast, but kind of kind of runs across the country um, but the war on cars podcast is great um if you're interested in kind of thinking differently about cars and transportation and and that sort of stuff so um, those are I'm happy to great. share my email too if people want to reach out to me and we can chat so okay yeah no that's this is great thank you those i think are really good suggestions um and so let's conclude thank you so much for spending I, it's it's late on the east coast so you're you're you've really given us your time which we really appreciate um, and a great presentation. We learned a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks for everybody hanging in there and, and asking questions. And um, yeah, have a good evening. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye all. Bye.